Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Transportation and Finance and Policy Committee for this uh, Thursday, January 26th. Um, we have a couple of bills on the agenda. Before we get to those, I um, want to one announce that we have a quorum, and um, we have minutes from our previous meeting. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move the minutes of uh, uh, January 26th. Uh, the minutes of January 26th are uh, moved. Is there a discussion? I'm sorry, 24th. 24th. <laughs> we'll, we're, sorry. Uh, we already have minutes from today. That's amazing. <laughs> That's pretty good, yes. Back to 24th. the future. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, the motion prevails. Um, so members, we have um, a couple of bills on the agenda today. Uh, both are going to be uh, laid over for a possible inclusion in a, a future finance and policy omnibus bill. And uh, really look at the, this hearing as a way to, um, you know, understand uh, the, the issues at hand. Um, we'll have future discussion, um, although we have set aside a, a good amount of time for each bill today. So this will be the real main opportunity to ask questions. Uh, we'll um, you know, surface issues, vet issues, and then come back to those later. Um, and I'll have more to say about House File 401 when I present it. But now on the agenda, we have House File 498, uh, Chair Hansen's bill. And I will move that it's uh, House File 498 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus transportation finance and policy bill. Uh, <laughs> Representative Hansen, you are always welcome in the Transportation Committee. Please uh, uh, let us know about your bill, and then we'll have um, some additional testimony and discussion. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Chair Hornstein and members of the committee. House File 498 uh, was in front of this committee, uh, I believe, two years ago in a different form, or with a different number, at least. Uh, and it is the Highways for Habitat program. Uh, trying to uh, encourage uh, pollinator habitat uh, in our rights of ways. Uh, in addition, uh, it also has a, a very uh, popular program, uh, Living Snow Fences. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. So the four, House File 498 um, is a bill that was in front of the committee, did move through the committee, I think was into the omnibus bill, had some appropriation for living snow fences, I believe. Uh, but just didn't make it across the finish line. So uh, since we've moved these bills or introduced these bills in prior years, there's been some activity at the federal level. I think some grant availability for highways for habitat type of programs uh, from the federal government uh, as there's been a strong realization that our public right of ways are an opportunity for habitat. I do have a DE1 amendment uh, to uh, get the bill in the shape I would like if, if the chair could move that. Um, and uh, Representative Hansen, I will move the DE1. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, and members, the DE1 uh, provides uh, some definitions. It establishes the program, uh, establishes an account, describes integrated roadside vegetation management. I do want to just note, you know, prior to me, uh, being here, I worked at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and did the pesticide applicator training, trained MnDOT employees uh, in conjunction with the University of Minnesota, and integrated roadside vegetation management is nothing new. It has been around for over 20 years. We were teaching people about that. There's been, you know, sometimes there's an ebb and flow of interest, uh, but IRVM has been around and has been uh, really kind of the, the language that is used for uh, managing our rights of ways. It, de it talks about uh, developing the management standards so it's clear what those standards are. It would require a report back to you and uh, members of the committee. And then uh, rather than being uh, quite prescriptive on uh, ditch management, it provides uh, the IRV language so that gives some discretion uh, to the commissioner. And I want to be clear, this applies only to MnDOT rights of ways, not other county road authorities. They're encouraged to have IRVM, but uh, it is required for MnDOT rights of ways. Talks about pollinator habitat asset management, a management plan, so we can have some look forward on what we're going to be doing. 
And then it provides a $1 million appropriation from the general fund for the Habitat program, a one-time appropriation. We know we've got a lot of one-time money. This would be good to get the program kick-started. And then for Living Snow Fences, uh, it has a $2 million appropriation uh, one time from the general fund uh, to the Commissioner of Transportation for implementation of living snow fences so we can get those in the ground and have them uh, starting to stop snow and uh, provide habitat. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, Chair Hornstein, you have, once we adopt this amendment, you also have an awesome video to yes, show us uh, about living snow fences. Very good one. Okay, so members, um, just to, to review, because I think this is one of the first times we've done this, uh, this uh, session, we're just simply going to um, uh, incorporate this DE1 amendment, and that will be the bill. So this is really just a, a motion to get the, um, a bill in the shape that Chair Hansen would like us to discuss it in. And then we will have, I, I would anticipate, a fairly robust discussion then of the DE1 after the testimony. So, uh, members, I will move that uh, <coughs> adoption of the DE1 amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All of those opposed, the motion prevails. So we have uh, House File 498 as amended before us. Um, and so I think um, uh, per uh, uh, Chair Hansen's last comment, um, I'll just introduce this short video. Um, you know, as an urban legislator, uh, you know, I was not familiar with living snow fences until um, uh, Chair Hansen brought this bill up uh, last year. Uh, and, um, you know, I uh, happened to be just uh, watching the local news a couple months ago, and uh, uh, one of our local TV stations had a, a, a segment on living snow fences, and I found it very educational and helpful. So look at this as sort of a living snow fences 101. And uh, I think it's a good way to introduce at least part of the bill uh, that uh, Chair Hansen is presenting. So with that, we'll cue the, uh, cue the video. Caused by climate change. We learned we spend close to $100 million every year to clear snow and ice from Minnesota roads. Seems like a lot, right? From giant plows and maintenance to de-icing material and labor, all of that adds up. But there is a way to cut down on costs, crashes, and the impact on the environment. I took a drive 90 minutes west of the cities to learn that all it takes is some collaboration from Minnesota landowners across the state. Pass along Highway 212 in Bird Island, Minnesota, and you'll see Vern Prokosh's place. You put it up there? Well, well not physically. <laughs> I told somebody what to do. A hard to miss roadside attraction that's popular with parents and their little ones in the back seat. We have some people that come from Wisconsin that drive by here a couple times a year, and they said that we just wait for the kids, just wait for the smiling barn. But what those travelers may not know is that there's something else in his yard keeping them safer on the roads. So this particular highway experiences about 4,300 cars a day. At this particular site here in Vern site, there used to be two big snow drifts that form on either side of his building site here. This is a living snow fence, a wall of trees, bushes, grasses, and wildflowers that blocks blowing snow from the highway. Front ones are plums, plum brush. Vern at some point was growing corn out here, but here's how it works. The state came in and paid for the land, and then a combination of state and federal dollars paid for all the trees, bushes, shrubs, and flowers that are here now. The state, of course, also now maintains the land. What the intent is, is to manage the wind. The amount of snow that gets carried by the wind can be 100 times greater than the amount that just falls from the sky. Snow fences can look like this or this from natural elements to rows of unharvested corn to plastic barriers. It all depends on the site, and MnDOT says they work. Here's a look at a stretch of I-94 westbound near Moorhead with snow fencing. MnDOT says the winds were blowing 30 miles an hour on this day. Now, a look at the highway where the snow fencing ends. Look at those drifts on the right shoulder. This video shows two-foot drifts on that highway without protection. As you can imagine, snow fencing cuts down on crashes. We find that if we're on a curve, the snow fencing can reduce the crash severity. 
by about 40 percent. Of course, MnDOT saves money and resources plowing less, but all of this is also positive for the environment. Living fences like this one sequester carbon and provide great nesting habitat for wildlife. They also cut down on the chemical treatments we use on the roads. We're trying to reduce our chloride use and chlorides are tied to salt. So the snow fences help keep the road warmer so that the salt's more effective. So you can use less salt that way. Some snow fencing is on state property, but a lot of it is on private property, a network of nearly 350 landowners across the state. Gullickson says some landowners have reservations about the program because it does require space on their property, but he wants to stress landowners are compensated and they try to be creative to come up with solutions together. We have found that the public safety and mobility is what really drives landowners to do this, more so than the, the financial part of it. They want their roads clear. They want their roads clear. Vern says it's made a difference. We used to get a lot of company from people that got stalled in here, but now we don't have as much company as we used to have. People knocking on the door needing a, <laughs> yeah. needing a push or something. Right. His neighbors sure appreciate it. Our neighbor here thinks it's a great project because he, he doesn't hardly get any snow in his yard anymore. Maybe it even helped you on a trip along Highway 212 and you didn't even realize it. Well, it's, it's doing what we wanted it to do. It's helped to keep cars driving through. And if you have a problem area near your home, MnDOT says it never hurts to reach out to them. They are looking to collaborate with more landowners, so they'll be able to work with you um, to see if a snow fence would even be helpful in your area. Research shows nostalgia can help help you remember ads. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> found that very helpful. Um, Chair Hanson, you can proceed with your uh, bill presentation. Thank you, uh, Chair Hornstein. And, and some may wonder why do we have the highways for habitat with the living snow fences? Well, they can complement each other. You saw in the video where you have habitat near the road uh, that can provide pollinator habitat and catch snow. And so it's a kind of a comprehensive list of tools that are there for the MnDOT road managers. Again, this is only on MnDOT highways, not uh, road authorities, counties, townships, et cetera. They're encouraged, but not required. And I believe there are testifiers. Thank you so much. And um, we will uh, have an opportunity to uh, question Chair Hansen and have a committee discussion after the, the public testimony. So uh, we have uh, Tina Markison. Uh. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. My name is Tina Markison. I work for MnDOT in the Office of Environmental Stewardship. Um, and so we'll just dive in. So, um, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Tina Markison. I work for the Office of Environmental Stewardship as the Roadside Vegetation Management Unit Supervisor. MnDOT manages interstate, U.S., and state highway rights of way for multiple reasons that are including but not limited to maintaining engineered base and slopes for support of infrastructure, water infiltration and conveyance, blowing snow like you just saw, uh, survey markers and roadside weather stations, um, aesthetics including screening to and from adjacent land uses, and also habitat for protected species. Um, House file 498 contains much of the work and practices that MnDOT already has in place. Some of these examples are we use integrated roadside vegetation management like Representative Hansen mentioned earlier, it's not uh, a brand new concept and it's something that MnDOT has been using um, in, in the 20 years that I've been with MnDOT. Um, roadside vegetation management includes mowing, biological controls, herbicides, prescribed fire, mechanical tree removal and brush removal, native plantings of grass, uh, grasses, wildflowers, shrubs, and trees. We also have MnDOT's sustainability plan that targets the planting of native, seed, uh, native seeds, <coughs> trees, shrubs, and perennials on MnDOT's large projects. As part of that sustainability plan, the goal or the target is to have 75% of acres planted with native seed, 80% of plants on urban projects are native material, 90% of plants on rural projects are native material. The reason why these numbers are not 100% 
is because not all right-of-way is appropriate for the creation of pollinator habitat and or native plants. We are developing specialized maintenance plans for specific areas on our roadsides where changes to standard uh, maintenance pr practices are needed in order to maintain habitat for these protected species. We also partner with and use plans created by DNR and Bowser, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, to help guide seed, mix, seed mixes, establishment, and maintenance activities. Finally, I'd like to recommend four modifications or clarifications to the bill. We will continue to work with or work together with DNR and Bowser on the, uh, however, the, the needs, soils, and follow-up maintenance on right-of-way and versus the typical lands revegetated re by the DNR and Bowser greatly differ. Instead of using their guidelines as pointed out in the bill, we would like to see specific roadside vegetation establishment guidelines. While the one-time appropriation will be used to enhance MnDOT's existing roadside vegetation management, the funding is short-term. This short-term funding structure is similar to the DNR's Roadsides for Wildlife program, which ebbs and flows when, grant and state legislative, when grants and state legislative funding is available. If the goal is to establish a program similar to Iowa's county roadside programs, then long-term funding is needed. As the answer to that long-term funding question in Iowa, the Iowa legislature created a trust fund, the Iowa Living Roadsides Trust Fund, to fund roadside vegetation management in Iowa. Clarification is needed regarding language uh, definitions that are listed in the bill. Some of these include on line 3.25, right-of-way mile. Um, that is not a term that is used in MnDOT, and I'm not sure what the, the definition is. Another. Um, term that needs to be defined is other chemicals listed on line 413. There's also a potential conflict with the noxious weed law that needs to be addressed. As stated in the beginning, there are met multiple needs that MnDOT uses our right away to address. MnDOT will need some allowances to prioritize these other needs above pollinator habitat in order to maintain the road infrastructure and safety. We continue to monitor and fund scientific research on roadside vegetation management and update standard practices as successful research is completed. We are happy to work with the bill author to address these issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, and are there any questions of the testifier? Chair Hansen. Mr. Uh, Chair, I think all of these things are achievable. Uh, be up to the committee. Uh, for ongoing funding. So of course I would ask if you wanted to do that, that would be great. We'll, we'll take a look at the Iowa uh, example here. I know that, that's a little dangerous to say, but um, <coughs> but we will. Uh, yes, uh, Representative Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So question, uh, do we have an estimate of how many miles of ditches this particular program would apply to? Can you explain to us how it would be administered? Um, pretend I'm a landowner on one of these state highways, which I don't own the land, but I farm on a piece of land that could potentially be affected by this. Um, can you walk me through uh, pretending I was the person that made all the decisions with my with my farm, which I, I'm not, but can you walk through how, how this will be implemented and especially how it will affect farmers? Yes. <laughs> Proceed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair um, and committee. Um, so. Uh, MnDOT owns approximately 175 acres of green space. That includes our roadsides um, and also median areas. So um, it's kind of our land minus all the impervious pavement areas. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, 175,000 acres, um, give or take. Um, and so not all of these areas would be um, underneath the pollinator program. Um, there is uh, ongoing research right now as to how close to roads um, pollinator habitat is beneficial and how much of it is a, a, a population sink. So we drive, we, we bring the insects in and then they leave that site and there's cars. So, you know, how much of that is, is not um, beneficial. So uh, we would be looking at less than 175,000 acres. Um, we, uh, um, we don't have an exact number on how, uh, where all of these areas and where the potential areas are. <coughs> Um, in order to figure out, you know, where the um, where to prioritize our efforts, we do use the DNR's Prairie Plan, 
um, to try to make some of those connections of those conservation lands um, that the DNR has identified when we do have projects going through those areas. Now, if you're a farmer, this, pro this program would only affect MnDOT's roadside. And so um, how it would affect your land, um, you'd have potentially pollinator habitat adjacent to your property, but it would not extend onto your property. It would be, it would be contained within MnDOT's roadsides and right of way. Does that answer your question or is there additional? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So if I'm getting this straight, uh, so I, I have a field that's on 169, all right? So I assume that that is a road that would be within the purview of the state mm -hmm. of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, my ditch, the ditch that we bail um, yearly in order to provide food for animals, especially seeing as now there was such a crazy drought in South Dakota, farmers from Minnesota are making considerable amounts of money selling that hay to individuals in South Dakota who are having a hard time feeding their animals to make their living. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to me how that will work um, with regards to my ditch on 169. So um, anytime that, that, um, that adjacent landowners or other third party wish to access the right of way, we ask that Mind that, that person apply for a permit um, with, from MnDOT in order to be on the right of way. And that just makes sure that, that the two parties are communicating any concerns that are out there. Um, we've worked with farmers in, in a couple areas of the state where we've got pollinator habitat and we've um, said, you know, we're, this is our goal. Um, mowing and haying is not um, totally off the table because it can be a management technique. We just need to have those communications so that we are understanding the needs of the right of way. Um, and making sure that, that those are being maintained. But it's that combination and that communication between the person who's asking for the permit and MnDOT to make sure that the action is going to benefit all parties. One more follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think to the committee, I think it's very important to understand that whereas I have a field on 169 that I farm, it is 217.8 acres tillable. Uh, we pay taxes for 220 acres uh, because that we pay all the way to the center of the road. So whereas we're talking about this thing called the right of way, we pay taxes all the way to the center of the road. We pay taxes for that ditch. And when, when the department or when someone is coming into our area and telling us that the land that you pay the taxes up into the center of that road, you cannot utilize, that's when we start having real problems. Um, I think there's a fine line, there's a balance. We've done this for hundreds of, you know, we've, we've paid taxes to the center of the road for 150 years, it's not gonna change. But I think when we start encroaching upon a farmer or an individual's ability to make money, that's where we start doing some real problems. So I'm not a huge fan of this idea. I think that there are ways uh, in which we can better it in order to make sure that, you know, I know a lot of farmers who are very conservation oriented. And so if it was, uh, and I know that this, this allocation probably will not fully fund the 175,000 acres that you uh, say that you control the right of way that the farmers pay the taxes or the landowners pay the taxes to the center of the road for. Um, I think that if we were to create a program in which those who want to, you know, there are some, there are some ditches that are just dangerous to, to mow. Um, you know, you, you can't do that. It's, you're going to tip your tractor over, you're going to have some issues. If there was a way in which farmers could benefit from putting that into something, I think that's a highly... Uh, conducive relationship, and that's what we need to strive for. We can't sit here and say, um, you know, well, yeah, well, sorry, you pay the taxes to the center of the road, but we control it and we get to do what we want. So that's, that's a problem. So I would really appreciate moving forward, if this policy does become law, I would very much appreciate us working together with the farmers, those who are consciously conservation-minded, who are saying, I can't mow this, or I have no interest in mowing this, I don't have animals, and I don't want to take the time to do it. If we were to work with them and provide them with that ability before we start willy-nilly saying, hey, you know, you've got a spot, the snow drifts, we're going to make a living snow fence there. Uh, there are areas where farmers are paid to leave one combine swipe growing. They, they just don't harvest it. And that is an amazing snow fence. So we can do that. We can work with the people who are trying to make a living in this state. We can do that. And we can do it effectively. And we can make sure that no one's toes are stepped on. And we can all achieve our goals. And I would ask that the department, if this becomes law, that they would look into making sure that this is a very, very uh, 
amicable relationship between the farmers and the individuals uh, within the department. Thank you for your uh, comments and questions, Representative Wilson. Um, I think that Representative Hansen wanted to make a quick uh, comment, and then we'll uh, have Representative Petersburg and Representative Murphy. Uh, Chair Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, when it's the public right of way, you may be paying taxes on it, but all of us are paying taxes and taking care of the rights of way management. We're all taking care of the road. And it's a public right of way. And there are differences <clears throat> among right-of-way ownership. So let's take, for example, Chair Hornstein. If for years I had a neighbor and then you moved next to me, and on the property that you had, you had an apple tree. And every year for 100 years, my and my family were coming and getting the apples. But now you've moved on that. And you don't want me to take the apples anymore. <clears throat> because you like the apple tree. And you're gonna feed everybody in the neighborhood with that apple tree. Because there's a public benefit in that apple tree. There's a public benefit of putting in the living snow fences. And the farmers are compensated. That's the two million we're talking about. It's to go to the farmers to compensate them for the cornfield. And choices, we're not, what we're actually doing in the bill is providing discretion to the department so they can choose a, from a menu of options to work with landowners to make the best choices. But there is the whole, all of us, on the public right-of-way. <coughs> and the public right-of-way is not for profit. It's for the public. Thank you, Chair Hanson. Um, Representative Petersburg and then Representative Murphy. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I wanted to, to just kind of emphasize what uh, Representative Olson had talked about. Uh, when, you, when you do buy a farm, you buy the farm uh, up to the middle of the road, and that's part of the land that you buy. And right away is different than ownership. And I think that's a distinction because the right away is actually an easement that is granted to the state for use of that, not ownership. Uh, but the right to be able to use it, unless I'm wrong in that, if somebody can correct me if I'm wrong there. Uh, but that's an easement, that's, that's there. And, and that means that uh, there is still ownership, maintenance, and so forth that uh, uh, the farmer has. This D uh, takes away all of the previous negotiated uh, d decisions done for road ditch management and so forth prior to this. And I remember a few years ago how contentious that was. Uh, dealing with that. And so I think that's something that we want to be real careful about uh, when we decide how we do that because road maintenance and uh, uh, road ditch maintenance also has a safety factor from deer and others that have to be <coughs> determined. It's not just about snow mm -hmm. removal either. And so I think it's, we have to very, be very cautious about how we manage that. And uh, I, I'll like to um, read that a little bit in more detail to see exactly what's going on, but I do think, as the department has said, uh, there are some things that still need to be worked out on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Representative Petersburg. And then our last uh, committee member with a question and or comment to this representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, my experience is I've bailed those ditches for my whole life. I mean, before me, um, I bailed ditches on. Uh, state highway. Uh, we cared for those ditches too. I mean, it was a, they're the part of what keeps the uh, grass down from being real tall next to the road. And uh, there's plenty of accidents on the highway I grew up, uh, grew up on. Certainly having options and thinking about those uh, with regard to Representative Olson's comments is key. I mean, uh, um, certainly to have options with uh, corn alongside. Uh, on the other hand, in my county that I represent, uh, Otter Tower and Douglas County, um, we have a lot of issues with wildlife, um, you know, so if you know where the deer are going to cross, that's nice too, because uh, I personally met quite a few deer, and uh, if these, depending on where uh, the roads are crossing and where these snow fences are, uh, and I guess my question to that is, are the snow fences ever um, going to be, or these vegetation areas, ever going to be an area that's uh, alongside heavily wooded areas or uh, grass-like marsh areas, where in our area, there's plenty of deer traffic, and I know my family, we're probably around 10 that we've hit. It's just really common up there to have uh, damage and to have problems by hitting deer. So those are the two comments I'd like some response on. 
Thanks. I think uh, Chair Hansen is ready to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, maybe the committee would have an opportunity to look at what the federal programs are doing now with wildlife crossings. If you're seeing uh, a lot of work uh, being, <clears throat> being done and funded, I think, through the Inflation Reduction Act on wildlife crossings. And that's not just for deer, but other critters. They, the scientists at MnDOT have a pretty good handle where there's a lot of crossings because you just look at the data where the deer have been. And there's traditional areas where they cross. And there have been, whether it's tunnels or other, in some states, uh, with migration, we don't have migration with deer compared to elk or other uh, herbivores, but they've actually built crossings over the road, and you can see where they go. So it's a fascinating area where there's been a lot of federal money. Obviously, we can't uh, build a bridge everywhere where deer are going, but there's work being done on that to help identify uh, and to do a better job of also alerting uh, <clears throat> drivers on, rather than just the old deer crossing sign, you know, but some efforts on managing wildlife. And, I, you know, the department can talk about the science a little bit, uh, that what they do with uh, IRVM to provide those research. When you look at some of the statute that we are changing, we're actually moving away from prescriptive this is what you shall do to giving them discretion to use the tools and the evolving science on this. It's that integrated roadside vegetation management so that they can bring in and put in, you may find a planting that is more conducive to deer. It seems like they eat everything on my farm, but if you are, you know, there's plantings, there's things that you can do, and there's a lot of science behind it. I Sounds like uh, we were asking for a comment here, uh, Ms. Markinson, uh, if you Mr. so choose. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair and Committee, um, I, I am, I, as I mentioned before, I'm a roadside vegetation manager, and so we have a wildlife ecologist at MnDOT that would be much more, um, uh, a better person to answer the questions regarding deer and deer crossing areas than I would be. But yes, we are looking at um, what's in our seed mixes and, and trying to, to figure out how to, how to minimize that. But any place that there's vegetation, there's insects. Anywhere there's insects, there's going to be things that eat insects and sew up the food chain. So, um, so yeah, if, you're, if your question is about uh, wildlife crossing and deer crossings, um, I would request that we, that we have an additional person um, who is not present today um, answer those questions. Thank you. We'll um, have one more uh, question or comment from Representative Murphy, and then um, I'll ask if there's any additional testifiers, and then we'll have some closing comments from the author and move on. Thank Representative Murphy. Um, just in my experience, the deer aren't very good at reading the signs. Um, they don't typically know um, where the crossings are. And unless you dictate uh, what the farmer is going to plant right there, um, we don't have much control. Just this last weekend, we went by a, a, a just off the right of way next to a, a, a farmyard, um, there, was, there was corn planted there left for, for the deer. But it's in near an intersection, and the comment was it's really creating a lot of problems because we're hitting a lot of those deer. So just in general, um, I think a, the farmer is, should be a really key part of this conversation, not the afterthought of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else in the audience that wants to testify on um, House File 498? Representative Petersburg. Uh, this, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is uh, just a question for you in general. Have we gotten any kind of indication from leadership yet on what kind of target you might be given? I mean, this uses $3 million out of general fund. And are there any indications that we may get some, a little or not? And I know it's early, and but sometimes you get some pre No, No, uh, uh, thank you for the question, Representative Petersburg. No, we, we don't have information on that right. quite yet. Thanks. And, uh, there are, uh, of course, uh, as you correctly point out, uh, we have a number of big ticket items. I think uh, if you look at the bill from last year, um, you know, that I think are still around. So, uh, right. Yeah, because we'll, this also takes money out of Trunk Highway Fund, too, right, which also right. is, There's, and, yeah. and it's a concern. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, I don't see. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. Representative Brand? I, he wants to testify. Oh, I see. Okay. 
I just have one more comment sure. in response to Representative Murphy, if I if I can, Mr. Chair. Well, you should proceed, Ms. Martin. <laughs> so um, one of the things with the living snow fences and the standing corn rows that MnDOT pays for is it's really important that the structure of the corn be uh, the corn plant be there, and that's really what's providing that that protection to the road. Um, we do not um, restrict the farmer from going in there and hand harvesting the, the corn. And so there has been in the past where a farmer has um, sponsored a 4-H group to come out and harvest, hand pick the corn. Um, and then, you know, there's some of that stuff going on as well. So um, so it's really that the, the structure of the corn plant that MnDOT is interested in for those living, those li uh, I'm sorry, for those standing corn rows when we are using that, that method. So... Yeah. Okay, we'll have a comment from Chair Hansen, then some brief testimony from Mr. Arnosti, and then we'll move on to the next bill. Chair Hansen. And, and Representative Murphy, if you need anybody to hand harvest corn, I know some Amish farmers that would be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we'll hear from Mr. Arnosti uh, briefly, and then we'll have closing comments from the bill author. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Don Arnosti. I'm here representing the Pollinator Friendly Alliance, which is a coalition of groups that are concerned and interested about our pollinators. Um, I'd like to applaud uh, Chair Hansen and the committee for hearing this bill. Uh, we think this is a really important step forward. Many, many years ago, more than a generation ago, there was a uh, just a broad fiat applied to how mowing should occur in the right-of-way for purposes of wildlife benefits, uh, pheasants in particular. This is a much needed update and increase in flexibility and tools that are being given to the department to apply modern science and the learning that's been done in 25 years that Iowa has been running a comparable program. Uh, there's a lot of research, which I didn't bring with me today, that Iowa has been able to do. Their Tall Grass Prairie Institute has been studying their roadside uh, management for years, and it has to do with uh, deer interactions and other wildlife impacts. And uh, I'm going by memory because I didn't bring the study with me, but my memory is uh, this kind of management actually reduces deer car impacts because the deer actually favor the freshly mowed surfaces. That's the, that's the browse that they like, and they're drawn to those freshly mowed surfaces, and somewhat older vegetation is less attractive to deer. Uh, there are many benefits from this type of management, uh, certainly for birds and pollinators, but also for reduced maintenance. And again, this has been proven by research in Iowa, reduced maintenance and improved performance of the right-of-way in terms of water <coughs> control and erosion control. So I thank you very much for hearing the bill, and we urge you to work out the uh, minor issues, really, that I think uh, MnDOT brought up and included in uh, legislation passed this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arnosti. Um, great. Well, thank you. I'll just make a couple of quick comments and then uh, hand it over to uh, uh, Chair Hansen for the last word. Um, appreciate, again, uh, the really constructive uh, engagement of the committee with this. And, uh, you know, this is really the, both for this bill and the next bill we're about to hear, this is why we do hearings. You know, we, we want to get the issues out, vetted, and, you know, return to them. And, uh, you know, this bill will probably be in a potentially different form. Um, uh, with, you know, some based on some of the comments that were made today and, and the suggestions that MnDOT had made. Um, and, you know, we'll work closely with the author on those. Um, and so the bill will come back. Uh, and, um, but I think this hearing was incredibly important in terms of, you know, vetting some of the issues. And so with that, I will um, ask for any closing comments from the author, Chair Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, I, I don't think we're that far apart. I think there are things we can work on to clarify and make sure that we're, uh, you know, there are differences where there has been fee title acquisition versus easement, and maybe we can delineate that. Um, I think there's things we can work on with MnDOT. As I said, it's not that far apart. Be happy to work with anybody on the committee, you know, particularly those that are inter interested in ongoing funding, Mr. Chair. So uh, I'm happy to work with you. This is an opportunity with one-time dollars. I think for the living snow fences particularly, um, to get those out 
uh, it's a proven program. And then I think the Highways for Habitat also provides uh, a way to reach federal dollars that could be coming to our state uh, to be working with people. So I'd ask for your support. I appreciate the opportunity and the ability to lay this over. Thank you so much. Um, and again, thanks to the committee for a great discussion. Thanks to MnDOT too as well. Um, with that, um, House File 498 is uh, laid over. Okay, uh, we'll have a little changing of the guard here and um, <coughs> be handing over the gavel to uh, Vice Chair Tabke. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, we're going to move forward with uh, House File 401. And Mr. Chair, when you're ready, would you uh, like to move your bill to get it before the committee? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I would move that House File 401 be laid over for possible inclusion uh, in an omnibus. This would be a tr specific transportation policy bill. As I indicated, uh, members, the other day that we will have uh, policy and finance moving separately this year, um, although this will have a small <laughs> financial component, but it's generally the old-fashioned policy bill that we used to have uh, in these parts of back back in the day. So, uh, members, I, I just wanted to um, give a little context for this bill uh, before I uh, uh, call on Mr. Burris to kind of go through it, um, some of the very specific provisions. Um, this is a um, an effort to uh, move along uh, agreements that were made uh, between the House and Senate last year, uh, in fact, in May. Um, we had a conference committee that uh, uh, Chair Nelson uh, chaired last year um, where transportation, state government, and veterans affairs were all combined. And um, as many of you know, uh, uh, because of the situation at the end of session, uh, a number of provisions were um, agreed to in this conference committee and that these were specific transportation provisions uh, that we actually had votes on uh, and were approved by the House Senate Conference Committee last year. Uh, but again, not enacted into law uh, because we didn't have um, a, a universal agreement on a number of issues and at the end of session I'd have to go through that history again. Uh, but just ran out of time, and um, but uh, so what we wanted to do was uh, House File 401 really uh, is an amalgam of those agreed to provisions. Now, um, I will, it, you know, I, I think it's for those who were watching the process last year. You know, I don't know if the, I, I can't vouch for the fact that all of these provisions were thoroughly vetted. Um, I think agreements were made and understandings were reached, uh, but you know there's not necessarily consensus on those. And so I think that what we're doing today is, I, I hope, uh, starting to vet some of these issues a little more carefully and uh, thoughtfully, and, and that's why this bill is being laid over. Um, since the bill was introduced uh, publicly, and a number of interested parties have uh, communicated with me, and we'll hear from them as well. Uh, there's the goal isn't necessarily to reach consensus or agreement on every issue, uh, but certainly to hear concerns and address those concerns where we can. And so um, I'm really pleased that uh, a number of people have stepped forward and, and we'll work on these issues as best we can uh, where there is, uh, um, you know, a need to improve the bill or need for clarification on, on matters. So I just wanted to uh, put that forward. And um, again, uh, this will, <coughs> this will uh, I think, move a lot of issues uh, forward uh, that we might need to hear separately or might have needed to hear separately. Uh, and, but we do want to um, you know, make sure that all voices are heard and that we can make these improvements. And so with that, um, Mr. Chair, I'm going to have Mr. Burris just kind of go through the bill uh, and um, and then I'll be happy to answer questions, and I know we have a number of testifiers. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Burris, please proceed. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Matt Burris with House Research. So uh, 
Uh, as Representative Hornstein noted, I, I was asked to uh, walk through the sections in the bill. I'll move uh, pretty quickly at a high level, uh, but can, um, you know, circle back and, and answer uh, further questions. Uh, so section one makes uh, some modifications to a data security account that's in the special revenue fund, and it, it changes uh, what the uh, direction is on using the funds for IT-related auditing. Uh, that is uh, direction to the Office of the Legislative Au Auditor, and it creates a statutory appropriation of funds in the account. Uh, Section 2 relates to uh, facilities that are used for micro uh, mobility, such as e-scooters, uh, shared uh, bicycles, uh, e-bikes, and allows for advertising on those types of uh, facilities when placed in the right-of-way, and this would be by permit issued by local units of government. Uh, there's a corresponding section later in the bill that sets up a definition. Uh, and then moving to section uh, three, this is uh, one piece of a uh, change in the statutory designation of uh, trunk highway. Uh, just for a little bit of context, uh, the uh, trunk highway system is entirely established through uh, statutory uh, descriptions, and this comes out of uh, constitutional requirements. Um, so changes in uh, the um, uh, collection or, or the set of routes for the trunk highway system are, are established through additions, modifications, and repeals of statutory descriptions. Um, so this is part of a, a trunk highway reroute. Uh, sections four and five relate to um, the state aid programs for county state aid and municipal state aid street and, and how uh, the routes are defined, um, like what's included in the, in the calculations for formula-based allocations of, of funds um, under those two uh, aid programs. Uh, Section 6 also relates to the municipal state aid street system and makes some modifications to a, to a screening board and uh, the, some of the requirements uh, around how the um, board provides information, receives information um, to MnDOT in, in its review, including uh, uh, modifying who serves on that board. Uh, Section 7 adds an additional special license plate. There are a number of technical changes that are um, new to this in comparison to, to last year to establish some separate subdivisions for different plates. So the substantive uh, language is found on page 7. This would create a new special plate for air metal veterans. Um, the rest of the changes are technical and, and conforming in that section. So I just want to note that because there, there's a, a fair amount of technical activity uh, going on in that section. Uh, and then uh, Section 8 is a clarifying change that relates to the um, Veteran Service Group special plate to uh, establish um, or clarify eligibility for that plate. Um, section 9 establishes that uh, there's not a fee charged for uh, another special plate gold star um, families. Uh, a couple other uh, special plate provisions are found in the, in the subsequent sections. Um, so section 10 establishes a new special plate for Minnesota professional sports team foundations. And then section 11 uh, creates a special plate for Minnesota missing and murdered indigenous relatives. And both of those are um, uh, contribution plates. So there's a, there's a contribution that goes along with each of the special plates. Um, there's some, some uh, general eligibility requirements that, that broadly match the, the kind of typical structure for special plates, uh, as well as transfer provisions, and then uh, appropriations of the, of the contribution funds, which for each plate goes into a, to an account that then go, is um, sent out. Um, section 13 is an addition in comparison to the provisions that were discussed in the conference committee last year. It would recreate, create a new reporting requirement for the Department of Public Safety on all special plates. Um, this is sort of a modification from what was proposed on a plate-by-plate -plate basis in the two special plates that had been proposed last year. So it creates a sort of universal reporting requirement on contribution funds, where the funds go, um, how, the, how the funds were spent across the various existing and, and newly being proposed special plates. Oh, and then I think I skipped over Section 12, which is a, a conforming change to, a, to another uh, provision. Uh, section 14 
uh, relates to regulation of various types of motor vehicle dealers um, and brokers. Uh, these are regulations that are enforced under the uh, Department of Public Safety and would uh, broaden situations when a license for a dealer could be denied by the department uh, based on things like um, not complying with uh, dealer location requirements or misrepresentations. Uh, Section 15 also relates to uh, motor vehicle dealer requirements and modifies um, the hours in which uh, inspections of dealer records can be taken or are made. Uh, section 16 is that definition I, I had mentioned earlier on uh, defining micro mobility devices. Uh, section 17 modifies a special permit for hauling uh, forest products. This section also has a number of technical changes that are largely to conform the, the structure and language with the general standard for how special plates are, are established in statute. So it's something of a modernization. Uh, the key substantive change is found in subdivision 1B, that's on page 14, and this would create a new type of, of permit or variance, if you will, uh, that allows for um, both overweight and over width uh, vehicles when um, hauling under some circumstances. <clears throat> Um, and then moving to page 16, uh, section 18 is also a, a special um, overweight vehicle permit provision. Um, this is for the farm product special permit and it would add to the list of types of products that qualify to be uh, transported under the permit. Um, section 19 uh, relates to a special series plate and also known as whiskey plates and would uh, eliminate some license um, holder requirements in order to obtain the plate. And then uh, section 20 adds to the list of documents that can be uh, provided to demonstrate residency in the application for a real ID compliant license or identification card um, so that somebody could also provide a uh, internet uh, service bill. Um, section 21 modifies uh, the eligibility and uh, documentation requirements in order for an applicant for a driver's license or identification card to get a veteran designation on that uh, credential. Uh, section 22 relates to, to the ignition interlock program and um, broadens the situations when insurance, proof of insurance coverage is required for, for some applicants. Um, under that uh, program on the basis of, of having um, lost driving privileges um, due to insurance related violations. Uh, and then section 23 is a modification to a pavement life cycle cost analysis uh, process that MnDOT must undergo as, as part of construction projects. Um, there are a couple of different changes um, in that section um, this is a modification to the, to the um, criteria or threshold when the analysis must be performed, um, some further details on the analysis, and then a number of process uh, and uh, review uh, steps that are uh, included in the revised uh, proposal. Uh, and then sections 24 and 25 relate to pipeline uh, safety violations. Um, both violations of regulations as well as failures to report um, pipeline discharges. And both those changes revise the civil penalties that can be imposed to use maximums that are um, uh, tied to federal law, laws um, that, uh, that, that govern this area uh, rather than having statutorily set maximums. Uh, Section 26 is a, a technical change that uh, is to, to clarify language as part of title branding provisions that had been enacted by the legislature last year. Uh, section 27 goes along with uh, section 28, which makes some modifications to uh, regulation of small unmanned aircraft systems. Um, primarily, it's to clarify what the uh, levels of insurance um, required uh, are 
And um, some of that includes some substantially reproduced language that's being moved from one section to another. Uh, section 29 is a direction to the Metropolitan Council to provide training for um, bus operators on assisting uh, persons with disabilities and mobility limitations. And then uh, Section 30 makes a modification to a, to a study that the legislature had, had directed in 2021. Uh, it changes the funding source, um, has the Met Council instead of MnDOT uh, perform the, the reporting and shifts out the uh, due date for that report. Uh, sections 31 and 32 provide for uh, jurisdiction transfers or, or turnbacks of um, trunk highways uh, subject to agreements with uh, a, a county and a city. And then finally, Section 33 repeals an administrative rule uh, that's uh, part of MnDOT's administrative rules on uh, transit operator reporting. Um, and then I might also note, uh, what, one thing I meant to note at the outset is that a number of these provisions had been proposed by the department uh, last year. I'm not sure the, of the status or, or sponsorship of, of them this year. Thank you very much, Mr. Burris. Chair Hornsey. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And um, I, I think that last point from um, Mr. Burris is very important. Um, you know, one of the reasons we want to vet this is that, you know, we're, have there been developments since this was last discussed? Uh, and, um, uh, and, and do we need to add or revise any of these policies? You know, I understand, for example, on the uh, uh, I learned uh, just yesterday from uh, Commissioner Daubenberger that there's been discussions over the summer, you know, regarding the pavement, uh, life cycle pavement provision. So that's an example of new information coming, uh, and I, we'll hear from some of those testifiers as well today. So um, it's good that we're doing this. And again, I think for, for some, uh, this may be the first time that the House has looked at, at these, um, because in, in a conference committee, as you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, there's oftentimes um, a provision that's House only or Senate only, and sometimes we'll take a, a Senate only provision, but it hasn't been heard. So this is uh, maybe it was a blessing in disguise that we uh, weren't able to um, uh, enact this because we'll have a more thorough hearing, and it's always up to us too. Uh, we don't have to take the Senate provisions either, but um, uh, these were uh, agreed to by both the House and the Senate, and so that's why they're before us now. So with that context, Mr. Chair, I, I don't know if there's questions. I know we have a number of testifiers. I would like to make sure that they, they have a chance to testify before we uh, adjourn at 10 o'clock. Perfect. So should, would you like to go to testifiers now? Yeah, I mean, yeah. are there, uh, I mean, I guess maybe, Mr. Chair, if there's a couple of committee questions, we can take them. But I, I am conscious of time and the fact that we have a pretty good list of testifiers. So. I have yet to see any questions. Uh, Representative Petersburg. Uh, just, just two, Mr. Chair, and thank you. And uh, so uh, Section 26, by the way, is, is a bill that I actually had heard in Commerce yesterday, and they have moved it to uh, uh, the General Registry. So you may want to talk to leadership on whether they're doing that standalone or included in your bill. That's the correction for the title license. Uh, That's a good salvage. catch, Mr. Chair. So, so you can check with that and see if they go. Otherwise, it may fit in your bill, too. Question is, just in process, are you planning on doing a bringing this back and doing a full just policy only bill uh, later and then a, a finance omnibus bill as well? Chair uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Petersburg, um, that's a good question. I, I think that sort of depends on our ability. You know, we'll be, you'll, you'll hear this in the testimony. I mean, there are some areas of contention here. And uh, to the best of our ability, I'd like to work through those issues. Sometimes you can't work it through entirely. Um, but I hope that, um, you know, our first bill deadline is March 10th. And if we get to a point where this bill isn't ready, in the next couple of weeks, we may, you know, just kick it into a broader bill. Um, one comment before the testifiers, Mr. Chair, that I, I wanted to make. Um, uh, for those, uh, I know we've had a, a flurry of special plate requests coming in. And I know we have a few here, and I don't want those who have uh, special plate requests pending to get too excited. Um, we, um, we're going to include these uh, because they were agreed up upon and vetted last year. And I don't think it's proper if we uh, choose to do a different process for plates uh, this year um, that, that, that these uh, would then have to be subject to a potential different process. 
Uh, so, you know, again, these, I think, were vetted. They were in the bill last year. I think they're good to go. Uh, but again, we've had, uh, I, I know uh, Ms. Swaggart and I, Ms. Swaggart and I have been talking about this. I mean, a lot are coming in. And I think it's, uh, I, I'm looking at Ms. Mann, um, uh, my, my mentor, uh, former chair leader, really did not like these. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, Senator Dibble and I are having some conversations about perhaps a, a different process to, to address the, again, massive number of special plate requests that we have. So again, good to go here. We worked on these last year. Doesn't mean that every special plate request will be granted moving forward. So with that, maybe we can do our testimony, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Chair Hornstein. Um, and as Chair Hornstein said, we do have a number of uh, testifiers today, so please uh, keep your testimony brief. So we have uh, MnDOT Commissioner uh, Daubenberger to start, and then uh, DVS Director Pang Zhang after that. So, Commissioner? Uh. <coughs> Thank you for being here. Please proceed. Say your name for the record and please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Nancy Daubenberger, and I'm the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Transportation. And on behalf of MnDOT, thank you for the opportunity to share MnDOT's perspective on House File 401. We appreciate your work to move forward some of these previously agreed to policy provisions from last session, Representative Hornstein. And I'd like to take the opportunity to note that the governor's transportation policy proposals for this session will include several of the provisions included in House File 401, along with several new uh, provisions. So for House File 401, we really appreciate the inclusion of several items uh, that are related to the governor's policy proposals from last session, including those related to turnbacks, state aid needs calculation, drones insurance requirements, municipal screening board, and reporting requirements for transit grant recipients. We do have some concerns to the changes to the pavement life cycle cost analysis included in the bill. MnDOT's life cycle cost analysis, LCCA I'll call it, was developed over many years using experience gained from past methods and review of other state DOT's processes, Federal Highway Administration guidance, academic papers, and along with input from industry stakeholders. So the current process is based on substantial research and stakeholder input and allows MnDOT districts discretion to use alternative bid processes and select pavement types based on factors like constructability, pavement type continuity, traffic control issues, and effects on businesses. The department met with industry partners last summer and plans on future meetings with them to discuss improving communication channels on LCCAs. We're committed to posting completed LCCAs on our website as soon as they're available with the goal of having an LCCA completed prior to a project moving into the state transportation improvement program. Even if it's less detailed, of an analysis at that point. And once on the website, comments could be posted with responses provided by the department in a public manner. We do have concerns with the language that states commissioner must make revisions to the life cycle cost analysis in response to questions or comments received. Since we could get conflicting comments or questions, that can't be reconciled with revisions. We also have some concerns with the phrase, determine the analysis period based on the longest design life of all feasible alternatives or 60 years, whichever is longer, since MnDOT's pavement manual does not have alternatives that extend to 60 years design life. Our current analysis period is 50 years in order to include at least one significant rehabilitation um, alternative for all options. We appreciate the intent of the required analysis of greenhouse gas emissions in section 23, subdivision 2B, paragraph nine, MnDOT has developed and has been using our Minnesota Infrastructure Carbon Estimator tool, we call it the MICE tool, to evaluate greenhouse gas emissions for the construction of pavement projects. And the Environmental Quality Board recently required uh, 
environmental assessment worksheets to use a new form that has a greenhouse gas analysis requirement that would be triggered for these larger scale pavement projects. However, we are not yet equipped to do an analysis sophisticated enough to differentiate between pavement types. A research and implementation project began in November of last year to get us on the path to be able to achieve this level of sophistication. And we also obtained a climate challenge grant from the Federal Highway Administration to further the process. We hope to continue to work with you, Mr. Chair and members, Representative Hornstein, our industry partners and stakeholders on this proposal and look forward to future discussions. Thank you again for your time and uh, work on this bill and I stand for questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Any questions for uh, Commissioner Dobbenberg? All right, seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Zhang from DDS is next. <coughs> Mr. Zhang, please state your name for uh, the record and please continue with the testimony. Uh, Mr. Chair, Pong Zhang, uh, Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division. And I, I just want to say thank you for, uh, to, to uh, Chair Hornstein uh, for continuing to work on this and uh, DVS continues to support the changes that, uh, that uh, were provided in this, uh, the DVS provisions that were provided in this, in this bill. And without uh, repeating uh, Mr. Burris's uh, a very thorough explanation, I'll just highlight the DVS provisions. Uh, Section 8 uh, that includes the, or adds the Disabled American Veterans as a Congressionally Chartered Veteran Service Organization uh, special plate. Uh, section 9 uh, includes the families of Gold Star um, uh, or Gold Star families for special plate um, access and, and uh, to ensure that there's no fee <coughs> charge. Sections 14 and 15 really clarify the dealer requirements so that um, both uh, our, our, our staff and our customers are really clear about what, what those provisions are or what those requirements are um, to become a dealer in Minnesota. Uh, section 19 really just clarifies the, the language in which uh, folks can, can uh, access the uh, plate, or I'm sorry, plate, the plates for DWI offenses. Uh, section 20 includes internet as a utility and we are seeing uh, more and more customers pr providing this document as a, as a proof of residency as they're trying to obtain the real ID. Um, and we, 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 we believe this is a valid um, um, form of residency uh, documentation. Section 22 uh, really clarifies the, or uh, ensures that we cover all instances where uh, proof of insurance is, has, has uh, uh, being identified. And then lastly, uh, while not a DVS provision, uh, we just want to voice our support for the uh, uh, missing and murdered indigenous uh, relatives plate. Uh, while not a DVS initiative, uh, we believe that the funding for that is absolutely necessary and we support that as well. And again, just overall support for those, uh, continued support for the DVS provisions and, and I'll stand for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhang. I apologize for my phone going off in the middle of that, so. Uh, Chair Hornstein. And thank you, uh, Mr. Zhang. And again, just if I wasn't clear, I just want to make sure that, you know, if you are following uh, sections seven through 11, as far as the, I'm concerned, you're good to go. Your plates are gonna be included. Uh, and uh, I know there were some conditions that, uh, um, that the Chair Cagle had on one of those, but um, you know, I think that we'll just uh, let that go and seven through 10 are, are, are gonna be included. Um, and, but again, what I was saying is moving forward, I think we're gonna have to reassess our plates. So good to go, Mr. John, on, on seven through 11. Chair Cagle. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Hornstein. As a, as a true Vikings fan, <laughs> I was hoping for a Super Bowl and then we'd be able to get our, our Vikings plates. But uh, I might have some plate suggestions, maybe. Okay. Some, <laughs> I'm just Good. teasing. <laughs> but thank you very much. Yeah, the, we further? can talk offline. If anyone <laughs> wants to talk offline with Chair Cagle about some of the conditions <laughs> that she was going to have for that plate, um, you can talk with her. Super Just Bowl to clarify, Trump. we're good to go on 7 through 11. Thank you, Mr. Zhang. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Zhang. Uh, next, we have uh, John Wolfgram, from, Chief uh, Engineer from Minnesota Office of Pipeline Safety. Mr. Wolfgram, please uh, state your name for the record and continue with the testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is John Wolfgram. I'm the Deputy Director of the Minnesota Office of Pipeline Safety. 
thank you for the opportunity to give you a little bit of background to the, I guess, the section 24 and 25 regarding the civil penalty changes for pipeline safety. This proposal aims to revise our current pipeline safety civil penalties in Minnesota statute 299F and 299J. This revision change was prompted in follow-up to an annual pipeline safety uh, grant evaluations that we have each year from the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration, or PHMSA. PHMSA comes on an annual basis as they are um, grant providers to our pipeline safety programs for inspection of natural gas, underground storage, and hazardous liquid pipeline programs. MinOps is largely funded through grants from PHMSA. In a recent letter from PHMSA um, and subsequent letters dating back to 2019, uh, PHMSA has encouraged states to, including the state of Minnesota, to adopt pipeline safety um, civil penalty provisions under the state, or under the, the federal uh, pipeline safety codes. Um, this revision would aim to revise our current 100,000, 1 million structure in statute to adopt the PHMSA structure of 200,000 with a $2 million cap as codified in 49 CFR Part 190. The most recent letter from PHMSA did state that if we were unable to change these civil penalty amounts, we would, it'd be likely that we would be losing our ability to enforce our pipeline safety uh, regulations and follow up to underground natural gas storage inspections. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Wolfgram. Seeing no questions, I appreciate your testimony, so thank you. Next, we have Rick Horton and Ray Higgins from uh, Minnesota Forest Industries and Minnesota Timber Producers Association. When you're ready, please say your names for the record and uh, continue as a testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for having me. My name is Rick Horton. I'm the Executive Vice President of Minnesota Forest Industries. We're a trade organization representing the large primary wood consuming mills in the state. We support House File 401, specifically Section 17, beginning on page 13, the MnDOT permit to, uh, for logging trucks to allow a wider width, uh, 12 inches wider than standard, up to 9.5 feet. Um, the major reasons for this are to fulfill a societal need and also to maximize the efficient use of raw materials. To the former, the standard ceiling height in homes nowadays is nine foot. Uh, MFI member company Potlatch Deltic in Bemidji makes construction two by fours for stud walls. And as you can imagine, it's hard to make a nine foot stud out of an eight and a half foot log. So they need to take about 20% of their logs at this longer length in order to make nine foot uh, wall studs. Um, and then to the, to the latter point, MFI member company um, Savannah Pallets in McGregor makes pallets and shipping materials and they come in all different sizes and at times it's much more efficient to use a longer log so you have less waste. For example, cutting two three foot boards out of an eight foot uh, raw material length results in two feet of waste. So if they can get a nine foot log you know, nine and a half is so you can trim the edges, but if they get a nine foot log, they can get three boards out of that and not waste as much raw materials. So, um, and then there, there's also a specialty sawmill up in Baudette called Jake's Sawmill that uh, is requesting these longer lengths. Uh, based on the timber hauled uh, to these companies compared to all the other wood in the state, this would amount to about 4% of the timber, so it's not uh, it's not every logging truck, it's just going to be a small number asking for this special permit. Thank you very much. Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm Ray Higgins. I'm with the Minnesota Timber Producers Association. We're a trade association representing loggers, truckers, small sawmills, and allied businesses in our state. We also support the provision, as Mr. Horton said. Um, you know, farmers in Minnesota can get a permit to haul up to 12 feet in width uh, for hay bales. We just want to do the same thing on a smaller scale, purchase a permit to do this legally. Uh, but of course, we don't want as much width as the farmers have. The current max width is eight and a half feet. Uh, we would want nine and a half feet, and that's what the provision indicates. Included in the provision are several safety measures that go along with it, flags on the load, wider mirrors, restrictions on when the loads uh, can be on the road, including the fact that they wouldn't be allowed here in the Twin Cities metro area. We spent a lot of time talking about safety with our members. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about safety with the patrol. We have constant interactions with the patrol, uh, looking for uh, advice on how to keep our members safe and compliant. Uh, we talk a lot about weight. 
Uh, and one thing to be clear that while the provision talks about having weight and width on the same permit, this would not change the weight laws in Minnesota. Um, this would only pertains to width, but the fact that uh, they would be on the same permit is why a weight was mentioned. But this provision does not change weight in any way uh, in Minnesota. We've also had, as well as uh, the State Patrol, we've had conversations with MnDOT and several other groups about this provision to try to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I appreciate, Chair Hornstein, your uh, leadership on this. Um, Representative Eklund last session, Representative Lizlegard uh, this session, and others who have helped co-author this provision. So thank you for your, uh, for your attention on this, and we'll stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Next up on the list is Sarah Erickson from Unite Strategies. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Sarah Erickson. I'm here today representing the Minnesota Regional Rail Association. I'm here to share concerns with just one provision in the bill today, um, the addition of the raw seed process grass on line 16.11. Um, the Minnesota rail industry has consistently taken a position against continued exemptions that allow for bigger and heavier trucks on Minnesota roadways. Exemptions to the state and federal 80,000 pound weight limit is a slippery slope. Every time the legislature approves truck weight exemptions, it becomes precedent for the next time. We testified last year with concerns in the Senate, not in the House, where this provision originated. When the state is making decisions that make it easier to pass legislation affecting our economic interests and it also potentially affects competition between industries, we will always have concerns. We appreciate that this one instance might not affect us directly, but we never want these exemptions to be a matter of course. Taken one by one, they can seem innocuous, but added together, they fundamentally shift how transportation, how the transportation markets work in Minnesota, and we don't believe the government should be in the business of picking winners and losers. Thank you very much for allowing me to testify today, and I will stand for any questions. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Erickson. Seeing no questions, I appreciate your testimony. And uh, moving on to Abby Braddock from uh, Minnesota Asphalt Paving Association. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. For the record, my name is Abby Braddock. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Asphalt Pavement Association. I'm glad Chair Hornstein brought up Representative Leader because I was going to if you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding the special plates, he thought special plates, or he thought license plates were for public safety recognition and not for advertising. That's not the main reason I'm here today. So um, I, I, I want to thank um, Chair Leader and MnDOT for being open to discussing these LCCA issues. Yes, we did have some good meetings over the summer, and I think we made some progress. What's most important to us in, this, in that portion of the legislation is the transparency that would be provided um, with explanations for why certain uh, materials choices were made. Uh, we do have a concern with the same section, actually, that MnDOT brought up the, on the greenhouse gas evaluation. Um, we don't have concerns with the evaluation. In fact, nationally, the asphalt industry is committed to achieving net zero in asphalt production by the year 2050. So that is not a, not an, a, uh, a concern of ours necessarily, but we are concerned that MnDOT doesn't have the tools we need at this time to uh, do those evaluations. Um, a greenhouse gas, or the LCCA evaluation is really meant to look at the cost of a project to the department. Um, looking at greenhouse, greenhouse gas um, emissions would be more of a life cost assessment um, product or process, which is different, uh, which is a different process that MnDOT can do anyway. We feel like that should be, be it would be better addressed with that kind of a process. Um, in addition, there are uh, so many um, opportunities right now with the federal money that's coming in. I think what would serve this effort um, the best way would be to have a stakeholder group to figure out how we can achieve some uh, good buy clean procurement um, processes for Minnesota. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Braddock. Any questions? Oh, yes, Representative Kraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, can you walk me through again? I do not follow you on the Representative Kraft, would you grab your microphone? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Could you walk me through again the issue you have with the greenhouse gas analysis? I didn't quite, other than you say they don't have the tools to analyze it. 
Is there more than that? Ms. Braddock. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Um, yes, the they don't have the tools to do it, but I also believe that it should be done within a different process. Um, the the LCCA process is meant to dis, to determine the co the financial cost to the department of a project, not address greenhouse gas emissions. They do have a, a, a product that they mentioned, the Minnesota Infrastructure Carbon est Estimator, but it is specifically not to be used for pavement selection, and it's not and it doesn't have the ability to evaluate the use phase of the road. If that makes sense. Okay, thanks. I'm interested in learning more about this, but you're not fine. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, thank you, Ms. Braddock. Next, uh, we have Dan Labo and Joe Bagnoli from uh, Pavement uh, Association. Concrete, there we go. I'm a little rusty, sorry. <laughs> Please say your name for the record and proceed. Uh, good morning, uh, and thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Uh, my name is Dan LeBeau, and I'm the Director of Engineering Services for the Concrete Paving Association of Minnesota, which represents contractors and material suppliers that produce the vast majority of concrete pavements in Minnesota. Thank you for allowing me to testify at today's hearing. I'm, I'm here to, in strong support of the language in House File 401 regarding MnDOT conducting and using the tools of a life cycle cost analysis in its road selection process. A life cycle cost analysis is an economic process. It considers many factors, including the cost over the entire life of the road, not only what it costs to build the road up front, but also to the cost to the taxpayers. For example, it takes into account maintenance and other factors after initial construction. It gives MnDOT solid and trustworthy information about what the road will likely cost over its full useful life, enabling MnDOT to include reasonable economic calculations in the pavement selection process in a transparent and common sense manner. Further, long-term fixes are frequently the best way to minimize negative impacts to both the taxpayers and the environment. Some quick history of this provision. In 2009, the Minnesota State Legislator, Legislature passed the current life cycle cost analysis law that requires MnDOT to perform this important economic analysis, though the language was general in nature. Then. In 2004, the Office of the Legislative Auditor conducted an audit of MnDOT's LCCA process and implementation. From that audit, they recommended MnDOT ways for, uh, to improve its process. At that time, MnDOT responded that they would continue to review opportunities to improve this process. However, effective resolution of, to those recommendations has yet to be implemented systematically. And last year, in the 2022 legislative session, a comprehensive overhaul of the LCCA law was introduced, which would fully account for the cost to MnDOT to produce designs, administer construction inspection, mobilize contractors to the project, and provide traffic control, and all significant roadway user costs, such as excess fuel consumption and the CO2 caused by rough pavements and pavement deflection. And a note to that, the excess fuel consumption language was removed as a compromise between the legislature, MnDOT, and various concerned industry partners during conference committee. Although we know that the differences in fuel economy between pavement types has been demonstrated in numerous academic research projects. In conclusion, we appreciate the support for this provision to require that MnDOT conduct a common sense life cycle cost analysis. Specific thanks to uh, Chair Hornstein, Representative Cagle, for the bill before us today and for the author of last year's bills authored by Representative Heinrich, Cagle, and Kosnick, and Senators Kiffmeyer, Howe, and Newman. We're thankful for the bipartisan and bicameral support thus far and urge your further support today. A life cycle cost analysis of road costs is transparent, economically smart, and common sense. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and stand ready for questions. Thank you, Mr. Laveau. Mr. Bagnoli. Mr. Chair, Joe Bagnoli with Winthrop and Weinstein Law Firm on behalf of Concrete Paving Association of Minnesota. I work for Dan. I just wanted to amplify just slightly on that, the, the issue that uh, Representative Kraft discussed and um, Ms. Breidick with the uh, Asphalt Association mentioned. One little area, and it's the little area of the uh, inclusion of in, in this uh, Bit of language. It's called uh, accounting for greenhouse gases. Previously, as, as Mr. LeBeau mentioned, we had a long uh, bit of statutory language that would have suggested how MnDOT look at this based upon academic research that currently exists. 
working with the department and asphalt and others and Chair Hornstein, that was reduced to MnDOT shall just account for that. What that is, and, and Ms. Breidick said it eloquently, generally these sorts of studies look at what the cost to MnDOT is. It does not take into consideration the cost to the user. We are suggesting that different pavement types lead to different costs both to the consumer at the cost of the pump. I think you've all been given this. So there's a financial cost to consumers at the pump if the road is, if the road is bumpy, if the road is not as good, and if the road gets bumpy more quickly. Um, that's a cost to the consumer. It's measured incrementally. If you have a bigger truck, if you have a bigger piece of equipment, it's more noticeable than if you don't. And there's a cost to, in terms of carbon green, a concurrent cost of carbon greenhouse gas. We're suggesting that the research exists, um, not suggesting we know the research exists from places that are well-established um, research institutions in the United States and throughout the world. Um, it's not new research and that we think we should include that as part of a cost, a life cycle cost, not just to Minnesota, but to the users as well. Thank Got you. it. Thank you, Mr. Bagnoli. Any questions for the testimonies? Thank you very much. Uh, that was the end of our uh, testifiers who've signed up before. Is there anyone who, from the audience who would like to testify for or against the uh, House Bill 401? All right, seeing none, any questions? Uh, oh, have, uh, okay. Please state your name for the record and proceed with testimony. Hey, Mr. Chair. For the record, Bruce Clavin, I represent the Minnesota Turf Seed Council, and I didn't prepare remarks today. I just have rebuttal testimony since our little provision was raised by the railroads on, uh, on line 64. Reader's Digest version on this section. Raw ag products, things you take out of the field. This section was passed in 2008 and it allows the, the growers to, to buy a permit to haul 90,000 on six axles or 97 on seven. We're already included with the grass seed under 16.4, if you look at that section, ag crops. What the guys do up north is they run it through a mill and screen it out, screen out the hulls. And the question is, is that processed or not? So all we're doing on 1611 is clarifying that the grass seed has been screened. No threat to the railroads at all. So I just wanted to let folks know what the provision was and why it's in here. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Any further testimony? All right. Uh, any general questions on the bill from uh, Rep Representative Pewsburg? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for bringing this forward. I, when you said you were going to be bringing it forward, I thought we had kind of a slam dunk because everything was we thought were kind of agreed to. And I was I, I'm kind of surprised at the number of people that I think were in the room and discussing this that now have some issues with that, uh, as even the department uh, had some, some issues now that I thought wasn't raised last year. Am, am I correct in that, Mr. Chair? Chair Hornstein. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Petersburg, I share your surprise. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but uh, having said that, I think it's, you know, important to, you know, hear, hear the arguments and make sure that uh, things are vetted. But... Um, you know, generally speaking, I mean, uh, you know, as, as clunky at times as our process was last year, you know, the, the, everything was noticed. There, all of these provisions were discussed in Chair Nelson's committee. Um, and I'm familiar with some of the arguments. But, you know, again, I think it's important to take a step back. We have new members here. Uh, there may have been some developments since last summer, so we are just having a chance to take a second look. But Representative Petersburg, I do uh, share some of your concerns. Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative uh, Petersburg. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I'll be glad to help and work with you on, on some of these things, too, because I, I think we're, we're close in all this, and it would be nice to get at least this part out of the way for this year. So thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chair. Mr. Chair, Representative Petersburg, we're, we're completely tracking together on this, and I, I think this will help us as we move on to some new policy questions this year. Uh, you know, we'll have a similar type of bill. It'll probably be even more weighty than this one, so it's good to get this done early. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Perfect. Any final quick questions? Mr. Chair, we've got two minutes left here. Um, 
Seeing none, any uh, final comments, Chair Hornstein? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, um, you know, again, be happy to work with everyone in the room on this, and uh, hopefully we can get it uh, going again here in a couple weeks. Uh, Mr. Chair, is it okay for my perch here if I uh, make some concluding comments about where yes, we're headed please. next week? Uh, well, thank you. Um, actually, before you do that, we need to uh, move that House File 401 is be referred yes. uh, to, uh, actually, is that House File 401 be laid over for possible inclusion in a transportation finance and policy bill. So. Thank you for there reminding us of that detail. Now, any uh, um, final comments before members, we... Members, thank you for a good week. Um, and then next week, we'll be hearing a number of bills. I believe they are posted or will be posted tomorrow. And... Um, you know, uh, many of them dealing with uh, some issues that we've examined before, reintegration license, uh, things of that nature. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I, uh, uh, Chair Hornstein and I have been working on a joint meeting between the Senate and the House and CTS, uh, University of Minnesota out of the Humphrey Institute, Centers for Transportation Studies. And I think you've all gotten information on that, just reminding you about that breakfast starting at 8 uh, next Friday, a week from tomorrow followed by a presentation. And um, the reason why it's important, I've been on that committee as, an, uh, as a member of their executive committee, and so has Senator Dibble from the Senate. And we do support uh, the Humphrey Institute as well as Center for Transportation Studies, and they are a tool that can be used for research of various aspects. And because of that, I think it's important for this committee to be aware of what they do and uh, what they can be involved with. Uh, and just, just kind of see where it's, what's going on. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for getting that arranged. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Sure. Any final comments? Yeah, I want to thank uh, Representative Petersburg for his leadership on this. Um, we were working on this for a while, um, and he serves in a leadership capacity on CTS. And this is a really, we've done this in the past members uh, before the pandemic, and it's a nice chance to, you know, interact with uh, some really knowledgeable people on a variety of transportation issues. And for us to you know, interact a little less formally, uh, you know, as committee members uh, in, a, in a different context. So it's always been a great event. I think this, as long as I've been on this committee, we've done this. So it's been a while. And again, thank, I encourage everybody to come next a week, a week from tomorrow. And I thank Representative Petersburg for his involvement in this. Thank you, Chair Hornstein. Anything else? Nope. With that, we're adjourned.